are there changes that can be done just on the U.S. side or just in the way in which the U.S. implements the legislation? And so for right now, I mean, I think a lot of the provisions that are under discussion, um, I think it's not clear yet whether or not they would require an actual change. I'm sorry. Whether they would require an actual change in the text of the agreement themselves or whether they can be done unilaterally by the United States in the way in which they choose to implement it. And the second part of your question is, how willingly are Canada and Mexico going to agree to these changes? So again, if they are changes that you have every reason to believe Canada and Mexico might agree to, say, for example, you were to import provisions from the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, now known as the CPTPP, which Canada and Mexico are a party to, if that's what you're going to do, the chances are high that Canada and Mexico are going to say, sure, we'll agree to those changes because they've already agreed to them. So the problem, I think, for anybody answering this question is we don't know yet whether the kind of changes that are being discussed as part of the, the Democrats' working party group um, are <coughs> ones that will, again, completely violate the text of the existing agreement or are ones that can be worked around um, solely on the U.S. side. Perfect. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I think there are obviously a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Um, but let's turn to, rather than the discussion on, on sort of procedural aspects of this, let's turn to some of the substance. Um, trade agreements generally need to be enforceable to, to be workable. But NAFTA's enforcement provisions are flawed. Um, Professor Hillman explained to me and, and the group, explained the three enforcement mechanisms in NAFTA and sort of the primary flaw in the state-to-state -state dispute settlement mechanism in NAFTA. So sure, so NAFTA does have three different dispute settlement mechanisms that govern three different kinds of disputes. Um, so the first one that's the easiest to talk about is the one, uh, because it isn't fundamentally changed, um, that is a review of any country's anti-dumping or countervailing duty measures. This is what used to be referred to as Chapter 19 of the NAFTA. <coughs> and that came about because fundamentally when the, when the precursor to the NAFTA, I'm really dating myself, the Canada Free Trade Agreement was negotiated, one of the things the Canadians said is we should stop having these anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases against one another. If we're a completely integrated market and everything is trading easily, freely, back and forth between us, why do we need anti-dumping or countervailing duty measures? Because we're going to become much more integrated markets. The United States said absolutely not. We will not get rid of anti-dumping and countervailing duty measures against Canada. And so the compromise was to have a special review process, which the Canadians wanted, to say we want somebody else to make sure you're not just putting your thumb on the scale and creating <coughs> very high anti-dumping margins or very high countervailing duties. We want somebody else to independently check whether or not you're doing this properly. Hence started this process called Chapter 19, um, which is a review of the anti-dumping and countervailing duty measures. In this new USMCA, those were basically left unchanged and as far as I know are not currently controversial. So that process will remain. The second kind of disputes was um, what is referred to as investor state dispute settlement. So unlike the Chapter 19, which is one government bringing an action against the other government, in chapter, in cha what is chapter um, 11 in the NAFTA, the ISDS provisions, the notion was a, an individual foreign investor can bring a case against a, either the can Canadian government or the Mexican government, a U.S. investor that has, let's say, invested in a mine in Mexico. And they say, well, now, gee, Mexico has passed these environmental regulations that make it impossible for me to actually engage in any mining activity because the environmental standards are too strict. I think that's effectively <coughs> taking my property away. And you're not allowed to just confiscate a foreign investor's property. They would then go to this Chapter 11, what is now the new ISDS provisions in the, in the USMCA, and bring a claim against the Mexican government. So again, it's a private citizen bringing a claim against the Mexican government saying, hey, you've effectively taken my property, I want compensation. Um, and obviously a panel that has to decide, is it, really is it really taking? I mean, just these environmental regulations, are they actually taking your property? And if so, how much is it actually worth? How much do we have to pay you? 
That process was very truncated in the USMCA. In other words, it was fundamentally eliminated for disputes between the United States and Canada with respect to disputes between the United States and Mexico. It was limited to only available <coughs> in a certain number of sectors. Uh, so again, a significant pairing back on it. The third one is the one that I think is the one that's drawing all of the attention right now. And the reason why is because it covers everything else. I mean, sort of every other dispute that's not anti-dumping and countervailing duty or that's not ISDS, meaning labor, meaning environment, meaning all of the other chapters, digital trade, everything else, would be subject to disputes under what, again, used to be known as Chapter 20 of the NAFTA and is now Chapter 31 of the USMCA agreement. So these are now disputes, again, under any of the rest of the provisions. Again, they are government-to-government -government disputes. So it is, say, the government of the United States is challenging the government of Canada or challenging the government of Mexico or Mexico-Canada, Canada-Mexico. But these would be disputes only brought by the governments. And the claim is basically whatever it is that you're doing, your law, your regulation, or your practice, is violating something that you agreed to as part of the USMCA. You said you would do X on the environment, and you're not. You said you would have these kind of labor laws and these kind of provisions, and you're not. So the question is, you know, is this an effective enforcement mechanism? The way it works in both the, the NAFTA and the USMCA is you say, I want to have this dispute, and the next thing that has to happen is five panelists have to be appointed to hear that case. And these panelists' job is to, first of all, figure out what are the facts. I mean, each party is going to argue, this is the way my law works, and this is the way it happened, and the other side is going to say, oh, no, 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 I don't think that's how it worked. So the, the panel has to, to, to base, collect all of the facts um, and then make a decision based on those facts, is there or is there not an agreement of whatever is the underlying provision? Um, so the problem becomes immediately, who are these panelists, and how are they going about their work? And the tricky thing in both the NAFTA and in the USMCA is first and foremost, they're supposed to be drawn from a roster that everybody agrees to. So the United States, Canada, and Mexico are all supposed to put up 30 individuals that are experts in trade, that are available and, uh, and are, are willing to work on these cases, I will say for a very small amount of money. Uh, again, it's like when you look at how much how many hours go into most of these disputes versus how much you get paid, you are definitely getting paid below um, the minimum wage, just to be clear, all right? So this is not, so again, how many people are willing to do this basically for free or close to for free um, at, who have actual expertise in trade law and, and who will be agreed to by the other side? So whoever the U.S. puts up, Canada and Mexico have to say, yes, I agree to those people, ditto for everybody else. Um, so you have a huge issue right from the get-go of whether or not you can get a roster agreed upon. <coughs> and what happened in the NAFTA was the answer to that question was fundamentally no. Um, in the end of the day, there were no agreed upon rosters. And so whenever anybody wanted to have a dispute, and the issue was, well, go to the roster to find your panelists, there wasn't one. So, it was, so then you're, you're down to the level of saying, I like John or I like Sally, and no, I don't like John and I don't like Sally. So you had a huge problem with whether or not you could appoint panels. Second huge problem there is that you're supposed to, you're required when it's your dispute to pick the panels from the other side's rosters. So a dispute between the United States and Canada, the United States must pick Canadians to sit on their case. All right, which again presented huge problems of whether we actually like all of the Canadian panelists or any of the Canadian panelists or vice versa again in a dispute with Mexico. <coughs> so the problem is that this dispute settlement system basically was hopelessly broken um, when it was done under chapter 20 of the NAFTA. I mean, by the year 2000, there were no more cases at all uh, because nobody could agree on panelists and because fundamentally the United States blocked the panel process in a dispute with the United States between the United States and Mexico over sugar. Now, in the context of the NAFTA, not all of this became super important because everybody that couldn't get a NAFTA panel turned around and went to the WTO's dispute settlement <coughs> system in Geneva, right? Now that was sort of fine as far as it went, but I will just caution you in this new USMCA agreement that only works if the WTO also has rules on the exact same subject that you want to bring your USMCA dispute over. The problem for the United States is going to be there's a lot of new text in the USMCA. 
There's provisions on digital. There's new, different provisions on intellectual property. There's different provisions in a lot of places that are not going to be able to be adjudicated by a WTO panel. So you do not have, in many instances, the option of saying, oh well, since the USMCA dispute settlement system isn't working, I'll just turn around and run to Geneva and get my dispute handled that way. You will not be able to do that in a huge number of the disputes. So it is really important that this Chapter 31 <coughs> dispute settlement system function and function well if you're going to have real enforcement of labor, of environment, of digital trade, of many of the other provisions that are in that are in the USMCA. So, and, and I, I think that's exactly right, but <coughs> Ambassador Lighthizer has been reluctant to support binding state-to-state -state dispute settlement in the past. He, he's a critic of the WTO's appellate body and, and the dispute settlement system in, in Geneva. Um, he has suggested that we rely on Section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974, which essentially allows the United States to bring uh, to do a report um, and then based on that report impose trade restrictions ostensibly designed to open up foreign markets. It, it's different right than an anti-dumping or countervailing duties case where you're trying to protect the domestic industry. This we impose under section 301 we impose tariffs ostensibly again in order to open up foreign markets. So what is the problem with his suggestion that we just unilaterally enforce USMCA's uh, text via Section 301? I would say the problem is those two words, unilateral and tariffs. Uh, so the first problem with it is because it is unilateral. In other words, the United States has decided that it can be judge, jury, and executioner. It invites Canada and Mexico to retaliate in response because it was not done through a fair process in which both sides weighed the evidence <coughs> and a set of panelists um, resolved the matter. By and large, again, by and large, I know, whatever Bob Lighthizer says, by and large, whether it's WTO panels or NAFTA panels or other panels, when a panel has really got worked through the case and rendered a decision, as long as it's a well-reasoned, well-written decision based on the evidence, countries tend to comply, okay? Because they do believe in a rules-based system. And when a fair judge has fairly said, okay, your provision violates the rules, countries tend to comply. They don't tend to comply when it's, again, unilaterally imposed against them. So part of it is the process itself is helpful in pushing towards um, a compliance that is far, far greater than you're seeing um, with a unilateral. The other problem with 301 is let's just remember who pays these tariffs. I mean, as many times as the president tweets, oh, if I'm angry with China, I'm just going to tax them. Let's just look at who is paying the tariffs today. We now have tariffs on... $350 billion worth of Chinese goods, who's paying those? It's Americans that are paying those tariffs. Um, and it is Americans that will continue to pay. So if there is a 301 tariff, we just have to remember that this is going to cause significant pain, if you will, and agony to the Americans that are paying those tariffs, which are often not in the sectors that are subject to this right. dispute. So you're bringing in innocent bystanders, if you will, and then putting these significant <coughs> tariffs on them um, and it's not clear to me how then these unilateral tariffs that we're inflicting on our own American citizens are necessarily going to be pushing Canada or Mexico to try to change or in some way come into compliance with what was the underlying nature of the dispute. So if NAFTA is sort of hopelessly flawed on enforcement and the U you have significant concerns about USMCA, state-to-state -state dispute settlement process, what can be done affirmatively to fix that? And, and what's the process, of, again, on that? How, how would we go about fixing it? And what suggestions do you have to fix it? Well, for me, the first and easiest fix, because Canada and Mexico are already parties to the CPTPP, is to literally just lift the dispute settlement chapter out of the CPTPP and insert it in, in lieu of Chapter 31. That's way easier, because there was a huge <laughs> amount of effort when the TPP was being negotiated to correct for all of these flaws that I'm talking about. The problem with no rosters, the problem if you don't like somebody else's roster, the problem with this having to pick someone from the other side's nationality. All of those things were fixed um, when they did the TPP. Um, and so to me, that's the easiest way because you've already got Canada and Mexico agreeing to it. That would be the easiest fix. But very clearly, if that can't be done, you know, one of the absolute essential things is to say to the Congress, we won't pass the USMCA until we see 
an approved roster that has been approved by the United States, Canada, and Mexico for all three countries. I want to see the list of 90 names um, already approved by all three governments so that you at least know on day one you have an actual roster in place. And in the new USMCA provisions, those panelists stay on the roster for their term of five years or until they have been replaced. So even if nobody gets around to updating the roster in five years, they remain on the roster until their replacement has been actually approved by everybody else. So if at least you started out with an existing roster and it couldn't, if you will, run out over time, you would at least be in a way better place um, th than you are right now. Those would be my two really most easy and achievable um, ideas for, for coming right out of the box. Great. Uh, let's turn a little bit to uh, the issue of IP and biologics. Bill Watson and I are currently writing a paper on this. Um, we're exploring both the USMCA uh, treatment of IP, uh, but also sort of considering broader questions about how IP should be included in trade agreements going forward, take again sort of outside the context of, of the USMCA. Um, so right now, Democrats, House Democrats and USTR are negotiating intellectual property protections for medicines, uh, in particular drugs known as biologics. The cornerstone, uh, this is a broader question for Bill, but the, the cornerstone of free trade agreements is that they provide reciprocal liberalization to the benefit of importers and exporters. Yet that's not the case with respect to IP. Uh, explain what U.S. trade negotiators <coughs> are attempting to do when they negotiate IP protections in FTAs. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think um, you know th there's a, a tendency to treat intellectual property as, a, as a, an obvious option uh, to include in a, in a U.S. free trade agreement. Uh, there are a lot of uh, U.S.-based companies that own a lot of intellectual property, uh, patents and copyrights. Um, it, it's, a, it's an area where the U.S. has a significant advantage. It makes sense commercially. Um, the, um, the concern is that the process for establishing intellectual property rules through trade agreements uh, doesn't really work right. Um, it's in the same way that trade agreements are, are dealing with issues like environmental regulations and labor rules, um, intellectual property isn't actually a trade issue, right? It's a separate policy area. And when um, USTR is trying to promote the interests of US businesses by negotiating free trade agreements, what, what's on their agenda, right? Wh which issues are they gonna push for the most, right? They wanna get you know, agriculture access for, for US farm products. Uh, they don't want to open up um, you know, US uh, textile markets or, um, or steel and those kinds of things. Uh, so on the IP front, what USTR is basically doing is trying to promote the interests of uh, content creators uh, and pharmaceutical companies um, by putting in place the restrictive aspects of US IP law that those segments of US industry really like. Uh, they get put into uh, free trade agreements as mandatory provisions, um, but IP law is, is more of a, a balance uh, area of law. It's not something where uh, when people are coming up with um, you know, considering uh, how to shape copyright or patent law, uh, that more is always better. Uh, and, and that's not the model for, for supporting a free trade agreement, for thinking that free trade agreements work well, uh, is based on the idea that if you're going to lower trade barriers, lowering trade barriers is good. Uh, you get more more lowering of trade barriers is always better. Uh, let's lower U.S. trade barriers. Let's lower foreign trade barriers. Everybody wins. Uh, it, it's not like that in other policy areas, and IP is one of those. And so, um, the way that the way that USTR approaches that, where they pick basically they have one side of an industry uh, on an issue that they push for, uh, can cause a lot of problems and create uh, provisions that don't necessarily reflect U.S. interests or even U.S. IP law. So the, the, the term of the day on this is the issue of data exclusivity. Um, 
sort of explain what data exclusivity is and what domestic law currently says about this. I will be honest, I worked on the TPP in 2015 and 16 for about a year. I had no idea what data exclusivity was and the issue of biologics, but we spent a lot of time negotiating over these issues, and so that forced me to read into this and, and sort of get a better grasp of, of, of that issue, because if you look back at, at what was happening uh, in the negotiation and plus the politics domestically, um, the United States was taking a really aggressive line on this narrow subset of issues known as biologics uh, and data exclusivity. Um, and it, we spent a lot of time and effort doing that, and we wasted, in my opinion, a lot of critical time and effort uh, that dragged the TPP negotiation out longer than it should have taken. So explain the issue of data exclusivity for biologics and what domestic law currently says about it. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. Trade agreements are full of um, provisions that relate to domestic legal issues that are really complex. Uh, so sometimes you have complex uh, trade policy provisions like dealing with enforcement. And other times you might have a simple trade policy provision uh, that deals with a really complex domestic policy issue, right? So data exclusivity is one of those. Um, basically, um, the, the way that Congress has created a, a system to regulate pharmaceutical competition um, uh, involves promoting innovation through patents. Uh, it involves uh, safety regulation from the FDA. And ultimately, uh, competition from generics when those patents expire. Um, but <coughs> FDA approval is really expensive. Uh, you have to conduct um, very lengthy and expensive clinical <coughs> trials to get your drug approved. Um, and so, uh, for a long time, there really weren't a lot of generic drugs on the market. Uh, and Congress came up with the Hatch-Waxman approach uh, in 1984, which kind of combined the areas of patent policy and FDA approval and mixed them all together so that we have things like patent linkage, where the FDA can't approve a, 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 a new a <coughs> generic drug when the original drug is still under patent. Um, where filing for a, uh, a, a generic, filing your generic application is an act of patent infringement that takes things right to the courts. Um, and one of the mechanisms that they created was this idea of data exclusivity, where um, regardless of patent protection, um, how long the patent might continue to cover a particular drug, uh, every new drug gets at least five years. Uh, of exclusivity in the market. And but that's, it's five years before anyone else can file a, an application based on that drug um, to say that, well, my new drug is the same as your drug, right? Um, so I don't need to go through the clinical trials. I can just say that my drug is also safe because it's the same as your drug. Um, and you, you can't go through that generic application process until it's been at least five years. Um, for, for biologics, the system works differently. The, the original FDA process created by Hatch-Waxman for this actually didn't apply to biologics. They're uh, regulated under a different law. Um, they're not technically um, generics. Uh, if you come up with a product that, that is uh, what they call them biosimilars, right? So a biologic medicine is a, is a drug uh, that's produced through a biological process. Uh, these are things like vaccines, uh, immune therapies, some cancer drugs. They're not identical molecules that you can say, oh, this is the exact same thing. I'm just, I know how to make this. Um, and it's covered by a patent. Now it's not covered by a patent, so I'm gonna market it. Um, it it's a, a much more expensive and involved process. So, um, the, uh, there was a time, um, I guess 10 years ago, uh, when Congress uh, created a, a path for uh, biosimilars, right? They had to add and create a new one. And when they did that, they didn't say, okay, we'll copy Hatch-Waxman and do five years. Uh, they, they set it up as 12 years. 
Uh, and the idea behind that was actually to create a little bit more certainty <coughs> for um, the, uh, the brand name the Innovator Pharmaceutical Companies so that regardless of whether you have any patent protection left, you're going to get 12 years. Um, and so the, um, that, that's, the, that's the, the sort of the process under U.S. law where exclusivity works sort of on top of patents. And, and I want to say, you know, there's, there's a tendency to talk about this issue uh, like, uh, like people own their test data. Um, we often talk about uh, data protection, we talk about it data exclusivity. Those are the words that people use. Um, but in a way, I think it's better to describe this as an issue of, uh, you know, managing markets and understanding when generic competition can come in. It operates outside of the patent system, and it's sort of like requiring the FDA to pretend it doesn't know something, right? Like you can, we, we know that this drug is safe and effective, but we're gonna act like we don't for a, a certain period of time. Uh, and, and the reason behind that is to manage those competitive conditions. Um, it's, not, it's not so much a question of whether somebody owns their test data and someone's taking advantage of that. It's, it's part of a much more complex system that, that's integrating all those different values. Um, talk to me about, so, so under US law, domestic law, it says, you know, biologics enjoy 10 years, or 12 years, excuse me, of uh, data exclusivity. Um, talk to me, talk to us about what the US NCA does with that and whether or not that differs from previous trade negotiations and trade agreements. Yeah, so the, the, the provision in USMCA is a minimum of 10 years, and it's 10 years of market exclusivity. Uh, so there's a little bit of a difference in language when you talk about data exclusivity and market exclusivity. So data exclusivity would be the time before you could file an application. Uh, and then market exclusivity is the amount of time before uh, the FDA or the foreign uh, safety regulator could <coughs> approve that regulation. So the way it works for um, for regular drugs uh, under Hatch-Waxman is five years of data exclusivity. And the way it works um, for biologics is actually four years of data exclusivity, but 12 years of market exclusivity. So the term in the USMCA is 10 years of market exclusivity. Uh, they cannot approve a new drug, <coughs> um, a, a generic version, uh, based on um, a generic approval process uh, for at least 10 years after the original drug uh, goes through. Um, th this is the would be the first uh, free trade agreement the U.S. has signed and ratified uh, that would have a provision like that. There was a provision in the TPP. Um, it's it was suspended by uh, the 11 members uh, who eventually did sign and ratify the TPP. So the other countries that are members of the TPP don't have this obligation. It was something that was pushed by the United States. Uh, but it wasn't 10 years. It was a minimum of five years, uh, and then a supplemental uh, provision that, that <coughs> called on members to uh, use a variety of other measures to ensure that it was kind of like eight years. Um, so you would get uh, effectively eight years, but you didn't have to do it exactly through this kind of data exclusivity measure. Um, and and it, was, it was interesting because it, it was a brand new provision that had never been put in trade agreements. It was clearly designed to promote um, a particular U.S. negotiating objective on having this biologic exclusivity provision in there. Um, but nobody liked it. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry didn't like it uh, because it wasn't, it wasn't long enough. Um, they didn't want something that said five years in there. Um, and all of the other countries in the TPP hated it. Um, and it was one of the things that really dragged out the negotiations and dragged out um, the, uh, the ratification process in the US, uh, you know, ultimately not working out. Um, that um, it, it, in the negotiations, uh, so, so the US term of 12 years is, is the longest there is anyway. Um, the EU has 10 years. Uh, Japan and Canada have different kinds of systems that ultimately lead to eight years. Uh, so that's why the TPP had this kind of this provision in there that said you can use something kind of like market exclusivity to get to get uh, eight years. Um, Mexico has nothing. Uh, they don't have uh, any kind of exclusivity periods. They 
their regulation for, for generic drugs is totally different uh, than the U.S. system. And most countries have either none or they have something like five, uh, and they treat it the same as they treat regular drugs. Uh, in fact, all of those other countries that I mentioned have the same exclusivity periods for biologics as they do for regular drugs. Um, so there was no interest in having a, another provision in there. Um, so in, in a way, this provision in USMCA is kind of like a, um, well, now that we're not doing the TPP, it's just Mexico and Canada. We kind of, you know, uh, we've got them on the run. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of a panic. They'll, they'll accept this 10-year provision that, that we couldn't get into TPP. Uh, and so that, that, that's what's sort of the difference, the evolution of this from nothing to this 5 plus 3, and now we have a 10. So if, if we happen to ratify the USMCA with a standard of at least 10 years of data exclusivity, and then lawmakers in Congress decide to lower that exclusivity period, <coughs> what would happen, right? I mean, that, that's where we get into the enforcement issues that Jennifer was talking about, right? Like, if the United States sets this standard, um, and then we turn around and violate it by lowering it domestically because House Democrats are currently pushing this right now. It was contained in a bunch of Obama administration budgets. This has been a long-term priority for Democrats uh, in policymaking circles. Um, what would happen? I mean, we would have a case filed and the United States would be out of sort of compliance with, with that? Yeah, it, it's a really strange phenomenon for a, a country to be out of compliance with a provision that it was the sole party pushing for. Um, the, uh, and, you know, it, there are other IP provisions uh, where they're actually uh, in, in other FTAs where the U.S. is technically in violation um, because of a change in U.S. law um, where, um, for example, uh, there are two free trade agreements, uh, I believe one is the U.S. Jordan FTA. Um, that require um, a national exhaustion policy for copyright and, and patented goods. Uh, so if you sell something abroad, you can resell it in the United States, um, and, and you're free to import that without the authority, without the authorization of the patent or copyright holder. Um, so this idea of like a global first sale. So if I buy a book um, in, uh, in Canada, I can sell it in the United States, and I don't have to get the copyright holder's permission, right? So, uh, in the, we actually have free trade agreements that uh, require us to honor a, a patent holder and copy holders, copyright holders' right to stop that sale. Um, but U.S. law doesn't actually do that. So um, there are some examples. Usually, just nothing happens. Right. Uh, there's no incentive to challenge that. Um, the, the main downside of putting in provisions um, that are controversial, and, and this biologics provision is very controversial. Um, uh, unlike the Hatch-Waxman system that was established for small molecule generics, um, th this, um, this biologics uh, biosimilars approval process has not worked very well. So we've been doing it for 10 years. There's not been a major decrease in price. There hasn't been a lot of competition coming in. So th there's, uh, that whole policy area is something that really needs a lot of tweaking. Uh, and one of those things that you can do is lower the exclusivity period. Um, and really that's why we are, why USTR is pushing this provision uh, so strongly, right? Because the branded pharmaceutical industry uh, really likes that 12 years of exclusivity. It's a big win for them domestically uh, in, in the, the process for regulating biosimilars. Uh, and if they can get that into a trade agreement, then it's technically a, an international obligation of the United States. Uh, and that makes it a lot harder um, <coughs> to get rid of. Uh, it's, it's just a, a, a rhetorical tool to say, look, th these are our trade obligations. You're violating trade rules by, by moving it down. Um, and, and just to create this sense that this is the US approach um, and, and, and it's part of U.S. policy to push this, um, and, and it, it's sort of ammunition to use against reformers who might want to lower it down, um, uh, which actually the, the, <coughs> the main target for lowering it down is seven. Right. So um, you know that's less than less than ten. It's even less than the eight in the TPP. Jennifer, can you? I, I was, I was going to add two, two things. One is 
again, I, I would underscore the issue of who's going to challenge it. I mean, let's just say the U.S. Congress passes something that brings down that period to five years or whatever the years are, less than ten. Again, the question is, this has to be done through a government-to-government -government dispute. I mean, is the government of Canada going to challenge the United States for not leaving it up at ten years? No. I mean, you know, so I think that the, cha the chances of a challenge are very, are very small. Second thing I would say is whenever any trade agreement goes through the first time, so when the Congress considers USMCA, assuming that it does, it almost, what, what it is required to say is in presenting this legislation, we assure you that now all U.S. law is consistent with the USMCA. I mean, that's the whole point of the implementing bill. In theory, the bill that the Congress is going to consider is going to amend U.S. law every single place that U.S. law needs to be amended in order to ensure that on day one, the United States is in compliance with USMCA. So if the Congress were to change the generics rule before the NAFTA comes in, uh, the USMCA were to be voted on, presumably the implementing bill itself would have to make that change. Sure. Because the presumption is always that on day one we are in full compliance sure. with whatever is in any any international trade agreement. Sure. Uh, Bill, talk to me. So what, what do you think we ought to be doing? What should be the U.S. position on biologics and, and IP maybe more broadly? But what, what, what should we be pushing for and looking for? In these, should we lower the exclusivity period? Should we allow each country to define its own standards, remo remove it entirely? How would you approach that if you were in charge of this? Well, uh, yeah, and, you know, it, you have to think about what you can achieve. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any value in promoting a, a provision that, that puts in place a rule that, that we're just not sure is right. Um, uh, so I, I, would, I would advocate just leaving it out. Um, I think you know, it's just an area that still needs some consideration and some thought. Uh, it's too early uh, to put this kind of thing in. Um, uh, you know, I think it's perfectly reasonable to go a step further and say that issues like this just shouldn't be in trade agreements. Uh, we should be focusing on, on, on tariffs um, and, and actual trade barriers instead of trying to set U.S. domestic policy or set uh, foreign IP policies through trade agreements. Um, they, they tend to get really controversial without creating a lot of benefit for the United States. Um, the, there's a, a, actually a proposal uh, potentially for the USMCA right, to um, change the 10-year provision um, uh, in some <coughs> fashion. Uh, what I have heard is uh, to put in a, a, a ratcheting <coughs> down um, uh, either as some kind of understanding um, or, or to amend the provision in some way where um, if the U.S. lowers it below 10, uh, then it would no longer, other countries would also no longer be required to go up to 10. Um, I think that's a kind of a strange thing to put in a free trade agreement where it sort of puts the U.S. Um, in, in charge of the international obligations of Canada and Mexico by changing our laws, then, then their obligations change. Um, but it's sort of workable understanding that this is a U.S. demand. So, uh, you know, if the U.S. doesn't want to demand this anymore, uh, then, it, it, then it goes backwards. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the, the complicated <coughs> nature of that compromise really speaks to how uh, sort of confusing this whole issue is. and. and Let's us know that, that maybe this is a whole area we shouldn't be involved in. Great. Um, I'm going to exercise uh, some my moderator's prerogative and, and make just a brief remark. Uh, one area that I think is not getting sufficient attention, uh, the USMCA contains a 16-year sunset provision uh, with a six-year review period. And um, you know the sunset provision references the parties can get out of the agreement after 16 years, but it doesn't specify who the parties are within each country. So is it just the president? Is it, does Congress want to delegate that authority to the president um, and have he or she have unilateral authority to withdraw 
from the USMCA, assuming it, it, it's ratified. Um, we are in that position right now because the NAFTA language is not clear. I wish that we were in a position where it took Congress, it, it took an affirmative action from Congress to get out of a trade agreement. That is debatable right now, and so it's creating a lot of uncertainty. Um, and so I know that Democrats, House Democrats, are pushing for changes, like we said, on, on enforcement and IP and, and labor and in the environment. Um, I wish, and this is my humble plea to anybody working on this, you should be pushing for changes to the sunset provision. Trade and investment thrives in stable, predictable environments, and a sunset provision, in my opinion, is just a ticking time bomb. So with, I'll get off my soapbox there, but my last question, and then we'll turn it over to, to you all to ask some questions. Um, do you think, take a step back, do you think politically the USMCA gets done this calendar year, and if not, does it get done before the 2020 election? It doesn't matter who. I, I, again, I, I don't know that I know. I think probably some of the people in the room would know more than I do. Uh, you know, obviously there's there's a concern that came came from the very first question that you asked me. Let's just assume that all of these things get worked out. That somehow the United States agrees to make changes to the enforcement provisions. Maybe they make these changes on the on the biologic side. Presumably, there's going to be stronger labor enforcement that may involve some kind of a joint mechanism. Clearly, Mexico has already said, okay, fine, but now we have to review those. So for whatever it's worth, that takes a fair amount of time uh, for both Mexico and Canada to review whatever these changes are that are coming up, uh, presumably. Um, Canada has not yet ratified this either. Um, you know, sort of a little bit complicated with the state of play in Canada in terms of the most recent elections there. So I think time is, is going to be a real issue. I mean, I, I don't think it's logical to think that it's going to get done uh, by the end of this year, uh, just because we don't yet have a deal, we don't yet have text on the table, we haven't started the TPA clock yet, and presumably, again, Mexico and Canada are going to need some time on their end on it. Uh, there aren't that many legislative days left between now and the end of the year, so on balance, I think not this year, and then the question comes whether it can be done early next year. I, I think overall, my sense is that there there has been a lot of good faith working between this working party group um, and and USTR, and I think on balance, people think that uh, the the USMCA makes very modest um, some good and some bad changes to to the NAFTA, but that on balance, it is better than not doing it at all. Uh, but again, it's a it's a small push. I mean, it does not make particularly significant changes. Right, right, Bill. I, yeah, I would add that. You know, the, the, the difficulty in passing a, a trade agreement isn't in getting the votes to pass it, it's in, it's in actually conducting the vote. Um, and, uh, you know, the, you had mentioned the TPA clock, right? Uh, the Trade Promotion Authority really actually slows things down uh, a lot at this point in the process um, because we're, there, there are requirements to go through a certain number uh, of legislative days and, and calendar days at various points in the process. Um, and you just can't get it done quickly uh, through TPA. Um, so, uh, you know, the idea that we could do it this year just seems just seems terribly unrealistic to me. Uh, I mean, it's uh, things are always possible, um, but the more that we talk about any kind of changes to the text, uh, the, the longer this thing will drag out. And it's possible for uh, approved, signed trade agreements to languish. Uh, for years before they get a vote in Congress. And we have been through this before. Um, you know, uh, when uh, Democrats uh, took the majority in the House in 2007, uh, you know, free trade agreements had already been signed. They were on the table for ratification. And it wasn't until uh, 20, 20, 2012, 2013, that they yeah. finally got a vote. Uh, so this thing could drag on for a really long time. I think that outcome is more likely than a quick vote on the time possible. Great. Well, uh, with that, I will turn it over. Uh, my only request is that you keep your questions in the form of questions and keep them short, please. Thanks. Yeah, right over here. Hi, um, <coughs> my name is Ben Monticello. I work for Congressman Jack Bergman of Michigan. Uh, how would you respond, when it comes to important provisions, how would you respond to good constituents saying that strong state-state, investor-state uh, enforcement measures in violation of U.S. sovereignty. 
affects foreign governments and foreign businesses determining U.S. law. How, how would you respond to that? Well, the outcome of a dispute is never to change U.S. law. So, I mean, we always protect our sovereignty by saying even if a panel rules against the United States, we always have the option of not complying. Uh, so, again, we, we retain that option right now. So, again, if the decision comes down that says some piece of U.S. law is a violation of the new USMCA, you know, we can simply say that's fine for a panel to have said that. We don't agree and we will not change our law. Now, it would then allow whichever is the other party to retaliate against the United States or to put some kind of a trade sanction on, but it remains our sovereign decision whether we want to suffer retaliation or whether we want to comply. That is absolutely the sovereign right of the United States, and nothing in the USMCA would change that. I would add that the United States does this right now uh, with Brazil and the cotton case of the WTO, right? We've been found to have uh, subsidies that are out of compliance, and the United States basically just writes a check to Brazil every year. Uh, so anyhow, um, other questions? Anybody else? Right here, Mr. Griswold. Dan Griswold with the Mercatus Center. So two issues, and I, I want to ask you how you think they're going to be resolved, if there are going to be any controversy. The auto rules of origin provision, which the U.S. ITC determined was a net negative on the U.S. economy. Does, it, does anybody care about that? Is that being discussed at all? And then a kind of sleeper issue with our Republican friends is the Section 230 provision that would extend the liability protection of online platforms. That's in U.S. law. Whatever your opinion of that, I happen to think it's a good thing. Yeah. But some Republicans, I think Senator Cruz just recently yes. this week uh, raised some issues about that. Is that going to be a potential issue that comes up in the legislation, maybe even losing some Republican votes? Anybody want to take that? Um, I'll only comment on the auto rules of origin. Um, uh, as somebody who spent a lot of my, again, I, I should have put my cards on the table, that I was part of the team um, at USTR that negotiated the original terrible, awful, horrible, whatever adjective we're putting onto it, NAFTA. And I will say, you know, one of the more complicated things of all of these agreements on all products is rules of origin. Um, and, you know, part of me looks at these new auto rules and says they are going to be very difficult uh, for anybody to comply with. Uh, because you have to track very carefully what percentage of a car, and you think about how many parts there are of a car, you've got to be able to trace all of those parts in order to be able to prove um, that you have have met the domestic content, the, the rule of origin content requirements, and prove what percentage of them were produced um, with uh, labor of more than $16 an hour, et cetera. So just the administrative sort of paperwork burden of complying with the rules of origin will far exceed um, what you win, if you will, if you are able to qualify, which is you, you trade duty free, and the duty is only 2.5%. So if the administrative cost of complying with the rules of origin exceeds 2.5%, you might as well not bother and just uh, bring the product in as a straight up import as though it came from anywhere else in the world. And I think that's a lot of what the USITC study is effectively saying is that cost of compliance is likely to exceed 2.5%. So this is a net negative in the sense that fewer, uh, fewer autos will be traded using those rules of origin, and more of them will be traded out outside of that. Um, again, there's lots of then side letters and other provisions on it, but, but I, I think that's the sort of gist of why the US ITC ended up saying that of all of the provisions of the USMCA that can be modeled, their their perception is that on autos, it means there will be less production um, in North America, less production particularly in the United States, and more straight up imports coming in from the rest of the world. And that is an implication of making the administrative burden as high as it is. Bill? Yeah, yeah thoughts would, on 230? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, you know, the, the issue about, um, basically, this is about intermediary liability for, for online platforms. Right, so uh, under U.S. law right now, uh, you can't uh, sue Facebook for stuff that somebody did on Facebook. Um, and uh, most countries don't have rules like this, uh, and it's a, it's a big problem for internet platforms, um, most of which are based in the United States, um, to deal with these legal minefields they have in other countries. And there's a reason why um, you know, Google wasn't invented in France. Um, and, and part of it is, is this legal environment that makes it really hard for, for companies to be able to offer 
online services that allow people to interact freely and not be liable for that. Um, it, it's actually part of the uh, US trade policy agenda at this point on digital trade to promote the US system of not imposing um, liability on internet intermediaries uh, on platforms. Uh, and, and the USMCA has a provision that the, the goal of which is to get other countries to start adopting that policy. Uh, so it, it comes at a time when, right, when there's some, some angst uh, in Congress about the US policy itself uh, that we're trying to promote. Um, I, I think uh, my guess is that at the end of the day, the commercial interests will win out. Um, uh, but um, you know, it, it could end up being another area where the US is pushing for rules uh, that it ends up violating. Um, you know, we'll have to see how all of that turns out. Um, but I, I mean, I suspect that that we will see rules, the US will be pushing rules about uh, online platform liability um, and, and about limiting liability for online platforms uh, in US trade policy for a long time. I think that's gonna be a, a, you know, an issue that we're gonna keep pushing um, uh, unless something crazy happens uh, with Section 230. And, um, I, I think that's that's going to be a, a commercial priority for sure. I, I think I'll, I'll just briefly touch on that. I, I, the United States, Europe, China agreed um, earlier this year to start a la to launch uh, plurilateral negotiations over digital trade at the, at the World Trade Organization. And I think as those negotiations take place, there are sort of three visions, right, for the future of, of the internet. And the United States has sort of a wild west approach, uh, very permissive, and China has a very restrictive approach, and then the EU is somewhere in, in between. Um, I think it's imperative that this provision remain in the USMCA. I hope it sets a standard, and we can then take that provision and evangelize about the benefits of a free and open internet system at the WTO, because again, there are, there will, I envision there being clashes over the future of the internet, and you just look to see what's happening in China with respect to you know artificial intelligence and, and things uh, that where the United States should be on the front lines of this. We have a comparative advantage on digital trade and, and all sorts of high tech uh, things, internet based things. And so again, I, I would really strongly encourage Congress and the the USTR to to maintain <coughs> Section Two Hundred and Thirty intermediary liability. Any more questions? We can probably have time for one more and then call it. Yes, sir. What's the impact of uh, NAFTA and these trade agreements? What does it have on the digital currency economy? Digital currency economy. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to think. Obviously, uh, well, I mean, to me, obviously, NAFTA, arguably nothing in the sense that, you know, somebody who was part of the process of negotiating the NAFTA. We didn't even have cell phones when the NAFTA was negotiated, or the internet. So I mean, you know, there's no NAFTA provision that would affect it. And I don't believe the USMCA provisions really do affect it, because at some level, when you're thinking about bit currency, you really are talking about whether there's any, any things that would push one way or another on blockchain accounting. Um, and I don't see that, really. The, only, the main provisions in the USMCA are to basically say you cannot charge a tariff you cannot put a border charge, an import charge, um, on trade in digital goods or services, and the USMCA doesn't try to define where, on which side of the line is a digital good versus the digital service, so they leave that up to each country to decide where do they draw the line, because it's a complicated line between what is a digital service versus what is a digital good. I mean, is a Bitcoin a good or is it a service, you know, et cetera. They don't try to define any of that, and the restrictions don't really, I think, touch on whether Ethereum or any of the other blockchain accounting systems, I mean, I should say ledgering systems, um, would be affected, but I don't know I mean, I was just gonna, I mean, unless there's like a national treatment issue or, or you know, you, you could come up with some kind of restriction that might come up against existing rules, but there, there's no specific rules. Um, and, and I don't know that it touches on any of that. Yeah. All right. Thank you all for coming. Um, we'll be here talking afterward, and you can ask anything you want. Thanks again.